So from the overall economic space of Singapore, I like to think of uh, trust as one of the key factors that has really brought Singapore to what it is uh, today. In the broad theme of trust, three elements. One, connectivity. The second is innovation, really. And the last is uh, talent. Trust in terms of the physical infrastructure and the ability to get things done. How do we continue to remain connected and continue to leverage all the seaports and airports? Just basic infrastructure. They hold trust as well as a system of rules and guidelines such that people know the environment they operate in. For Singapore, there are two real urban dynamics that play an important role. The first is our urban infrastructure. So from the beginning, we planned the city very efficiently. We built up the necessary urban infra infrastructure, whether this is housing, transport, ports, the airport. So we ensured that there was sufficient infrastructure to let the economy function efficiently so that people could get to work. Uh, companies would be able to have access to stable electricity, internet, all the basic hygiene factors for, for businesses to operate. And the second thing we did was that we planned for clustering. What I mean is that we intentionally set out a central business district. We had firms who could work closely together. We also had decentralized uh, business districts. So that is a process that is still ongoing. Uh, some of the examples in more recent times would be your Pongo Digital District, Jurong Innovation District. So in Singapore, our urban planning is very focused on the needs of businesses, of the economy. We want to create innovation clusters where firms, entrepreneurs who come together, new ideas and new businesses. So in that way, we experience a lot of increasing returns to our economic activity because we plan the space very carefully to cater to the needs of all these businesses. So Singapore's neutral location is really something that facilitates this connectivity as well. Because companies then look into Singapore as a neutral standpoint, as somewhere where East meets West, where cultures are understood, but also global business laws are also recognised and practices are also recognised as well. And so if, you, if I think about this client who came overseas and met us here in Singapore, they really wanted to get things done as quickly as possible and as much as possible. And I think it was amazing that what brings out Singapore as a HQ location, a business location, in terms of the ecosystem of business partners, so you have business connectivity and you had a physical proximity as Singapore being a small island, that he could quickly connect with many different kinds of folks in order to think about how his logistics needs could be adequately addressed. And he had also personal financial needs as well, which I think uh, overall he was able to address and then be able to meet the right people in order to do so. As a global financial centre, I think it is critical that we remain competitive and relevant to this increasingly digitised uh, global economy. And one of the ways we have done so is to explore these emerging sectors such as fintech, cryptocurrency, blockchain, the ways that technology has intersected with finance, with economic activity. And I believe that we have built up a lot of the expertise for exploring these sectors. So that is a key way that we have retained the competitiveness of our global financial centre. Over the past you know, 10 to 20 years, what really drove innovation was really something along the lines of a knowledge economy, whereby the universities and the research institutes in Singapore actually contributed much in order to drive innovation and really boost the knowledge capacity. And much of some of the newer industries like biotechnology came out from that knowledge base. But if I think about the future and I think about innovation, it has not lost its scientific appeal, but it has added the elements of speed as well as agility. And as I was talking to some of the startups in Singapore itself, they talk about how in ASEAN, the capabilities may be uneven, but if you know how the culture and the business and work processes of some of the IT and traditional comm science people, you can still tap on that talent in order to drive that digital innovation that you are also seeking. And so what I see is you need new capabilities on digital front and agile front, a mix of business processes and digital. But I think that new capability for Singapore to garner and manage regional, if not global talent in order to achieve innovation across borders, I think that will render Singapore well in terms of innovation in the future uh, itself. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for Singapore to tap into the global digital economy. 
And we have developed the economy in a way. We have developed a very strong global financial centre. We have fostered the creation of a tech sector, an innovation hub. And certainly we have planned the city in such a way that space is created for all these businesses. So I think there is plenty of opportunity for Singapore in the post-COVID world. Good morning and welcome to Forum 4 of Singapore Perspectives 2022. I'm Junjie, your moderator for today. Today's forum is entitled City as Economic Space. It builds on some of the points that were raised in earlier sessions. In the opening session of this conference, Health Minister Ong Yi Kang highlighted the importance of Singapore's diverse economic base as well as our connectedness to the global economy. He identified these as key drivers of Singapore's resilience and our economic viability. In the rest of this session, we will further explore this line of thought. We will discuss the urban economic developments and the regional and global dynamics that have driven Singapore's economic success. And today, I'm very privileged to be joined by three speakers who are true experts in their fields. The first speaker is Professor Edward Glazer, one of the world's leading urban economists. Based in Harvard University's Department of Economics, Professor Glazer's seminal work, The Triumph of the City, was shortlisted for the Financial Times and McKinsey Best Book of the Year Award in 2011. His latest book, Survival of the City, discusses our urban future in a post-pandemic world. Now, due to time zone differences, Professor Glazer is not able to participate in this forum live. He has, however, pre-recorded his speech for us, and he will tell us a little bit more about some of the post-pandemic urban economic dynamics that were highlighted in his book. Our second speaker is Mr. Gabriel Lim, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Prior to his current appointment, Mr. Lim was Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Communications and Information and Chief Executive of the Info Communications Media Development Authority. He has served a wide range of policy uh, areas including being uh, Principal Private Secretary to Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. He has previously served in the Ministry of Defence, Ministry of Health and the Public Service Department, Public Service Division, pardon me. We really look forward to, to hearing from his policy expertise and experience. Our third speaker is Dr. David Skilling, Founding Director of Landfall Strategy Group. Dr. Skilling has previously served as Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand where he established and coordinated the Small Advanced Economies Initiative, a grouping of senior government officials from small advanced economies. Dr. Skilling writes regularly on global economic and political issues, especially with regards to small advanced economies. Much, many of his writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Project Syndicate, Foreign Affairs, The Times, Nikkei Asian Review, and The, the Straits Times. So we really look forward to hearing from our three speakers. But before we begin today's sessions, I would like to highlight a few administrative uh, notes for the Q&A segment. For the Q&A, we would request the audience to submit their questions via the question submission section on this forum page. You can access it at the bottom of this page. And you can submit the questions at any point in time during this session. We invite all at our conference to contribute to our discussions in a respectful and safe manner that focuses on the issues at hand. Uh, this session is open for media coverage, and IPS reserves the right to act in a way to ensure that this is, the discussions are respectful and safe at all times. So without further ado, I would like to first broadcast Professor Glazer's pre-recorded speech. Hello, I'm Ed Glazer, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you live, but uh, I'm delighted to talk to you uh, about the future of cities and their enduring strengths and their weaknesses. Um, much of this talk is taken from a new book of mine with David Cutler called Survival of the City, Living and Thriving in an Age of Isolation. Um, if I were giving this talk two and a half years ago, I would probably start with two graphs uh, like the ones that will follow. This one 
shows the European Union, the 1,114 nuts three regions. I've ordered them on the basis of their density level because cities at their heart are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. The blue line shows the relationship between per capita GDP and density across Europe. The densest tenth of Europe's regions have incomes that are twice as high as the least dense half of Europe's incomes. This is something economists call agglomeration economies. The fact that we as human beings become more productive when we are enmeshed in a maelstrom of economic activity. The red line shows the relationship between initial population density and subsequent population growth. So whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving our dense enclaves on the Eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, uh, we're clustering in. This takes a more global perspective. In this graph, I'm showing the relationship between urbanization in 1960 and per capita income growth over the next 50 years, the true long haul. What you can see here, and this is just for countries that had per capita incomes below $5,000 in 1960, which includes Singapore, uh, for these countries, there's a strong, robust relationship between urbanization and subsequent income growth. This does not mean to say that we should artificially boost urbanization in uh, the cities of Sub-Saharan Africa or, or South America, but it does mean that I know of no path out of poverty into prosperity that does not run through city streets. And then all of a sudden, plague returned, COVID-19 pandemic. Plague is an old companion of urban life. Our first well-recorded urban plague is the plague of Athens, which struck that city in 430 BCE. The backstory for this was Athens was doing all that you could possibly ask a great city to do. It was a city where combinations of geniuses worked together, learned from one another, and created breakthroughs in culture, like drama or sculpture, in philosophy and mathematics. It was an economic powerhouse. It was a military uh, hero, right? And all of a sudden, um, its grandeur, its success faltered. The immediate problem was that all of the Athenian success had excited the envy of its land-based military rival, Sparta. Sparta challenged Athens. Pericles, the leader of the Athenian democracy, pushed back. The Peloponnesian War started. Pericles' strategy was to summon the Athenians and their Attic allies behind the walls of the city, trusting to those walls to keep out the Spartan warriors, and then send out the superior Athenian fleet to harass the Peloponnesian coastline. The strategy was sound militarily, but walls that can keep out enemy soldiers may not keep out a virus or bacteria. And that's exactly how it was. Athens, like our cities today, was a node on the global lattice of travel, transport, and trade. And so some form of plague entered in through the port of Piraeus. It laid utter waste to the city. Thucydides, one of the two fathers of history who lived in fifth century Athens, was there. And he recounts a city that goes that went amok. People lived for the day because they did not expect to see tomorrow. Um, Athens lost perhaps one fourth of its population over two years, a death rate that is perhaps a hundred times that experienced by COVID-19. Um, and while Athens would soldier on before eventually losing the war to Sparta 25 years later, its glory was forever dimmed. Even more catastrophic plagues were to come, like the plague of Justinian uh, that hit the city of Constantinople in 541 CE and really ended that emperor's uh, attempt to reimpose peace on the Mediterranean world and ushered in almost a millennia of darkness in Europe. Um, but for most of the past 200 years, our cities have been fairly robust to disease. This was despite the fact that plagues you know, came in the 19th century with a fair amount of regularity. This was an early period of globalization and so diseases globetrotted like yellow fever, a mosquito-borne illness that emerged out of Sub-Saharan Africa in the 18th century, came up to the cities of the Eastern seaboard in the US like Philadelphia and New York. You can see here the death rates per capita over the last 200 years in New York. Yellow fever, again, causing death rates that are perhaps um, 10 times those of COVID-19. And then in 1817, out of the Ganges Delta, cholera emerges, travels along with the British army, travels along with the Russian army, makes its way west, and eventually uh, comes to London, Paris, and New York. You can see there, 1832 was the first major outbreak. 1849, uh, another major one. That, that was one my great-great-great-grandfather died in that one. Um, but cities survived in part because they invested in the infrastructure they needed to survive. They built aqueducts, they built sewers, and they invested in the incentives 
and institutions that would complement that infrastructure. You can see the aqueduct is opened here in 1842, you know, and the cholera epidemics still keep on coming. It's not until 1866 the Board of Health gets put in place, which starts imposing fines on tenement owners who don't connect to the water system, that you really start seeing death rates fall. Um, and because of these investments, and they were very expensive, America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as our national government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But it was thanks to those investments that, in fact, we have enjoyed a blessed century of urban health. Since the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919, our cities have been remarkably safe. But it reminds us, of course, that protecting our cities from health is a major job. And I think going forward, we should expect to spend enormous amounts to make sure that the plague that has currently hit us is a one-time event. Now, when it first struck America, COVID-19 appeared once again to be a particularly urban event because the disease entered in through great cities like New York, uh, Boston, uh, New Orleans, um, and not so much within the US or within Singapore, but in cities like, um, like the Indian cities that have crowded slums, uh, the disease really spread very, very quickly because there's no social isolation in an Indian slum or a Brazilian favela. Um, this just shows the relationship between COVID rates and the share of the population living in slums. Um, as of this is about July, uh, June, 2020, uh, the remarkable work of Anup Milani shows by looking at serological work for the presence of COVID-19 antibodies that by July 2020, more than 50%, more than one half of the residents of many Mumbai slums had already been infected with COVID-19. Luckily, the death rates were relatively low uh, because they are poor, they're thin, and they're young. Of course, an airborne pandemic, unlike a waterborne pandemic like cholera, can spread everywhere. And by November 2020, this was a disease which in the US was associated with many of the lowest density parts of the city. Moreover, within our cities, there's little evidence that this is spread by high density living. Um, so this is a map of the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, you can see here the disease is actually rarest in Manhattan, that's the sliver over here, and in the high density areas of, of Brooklyn. It's heaviest in the lower, lower density parts on the outskirts of the city. Why is that? Well, it seems to suggest two things, one of which is we don't have to worry very much about apartment buildings being a cause of the plague. But it's not dense living, it's connectivity that actually spreads the, the disease. This is the first plague we have in history in which we can really measure people's mobility. This comes from cellular records, from safe graph, and it shows the extent to which mobility declined in the inner parts of, of New York. You can see those areas that, that had the sharpest declines in the city center had the least prevalence of the disease. This is not because the people of the city center are somehow they're smarter or better. It's because they were richer. It's because they were better educated. It's because they were in industries that were not essential. They didn't work in hospitals or pharmacies, and they could telecommute. And because they could change their behavior, they could protect themselves. Now, of course, this epidemic, this pandemic, is not just a health event. It is an economic event. And it is an event that very much challenges our urban economies. Now, if you go back historically, let's say to the Black Death that came to Europe in 1350 CE, um, when disease strikes a subsistence agricultural economy, the people who survive are actually richer because wealth in an agricultural economy is based on the amount of land per capita. And when you kill off a third of the population, as you did, for example, uh, in Europe, it means that the remaining population have 50% more land per capita. And so wages soared after the Black Death. And that extra income enabled the people in Europe to actually buy more luxury goods, which helped fuel uh, the urban renaissance of the, of the 15th century. Move forward to the influenza pandemic, which struck the industrial economy of 1918-1919. The work of Francois Veld of the Chicago Fed really you know, he has a deep diagnosis of this. He really finds a short, sharp recession associated with mines closing, with factories closing. But people still demanded durable goods uh, during the recession, uh, during the pandemic, as they did today. Um, and so the factories kept churning out cars. They kept churning out ice boxes. And so the industrial economy recovered. Over the last 100 years, the factories have automated, they've outsourced, and for less skilled workers throughout the world, the ability to serve a cappuccino with a smile has been an employment safe haven in, in a time of robots. Yet those jobs can vanish in a heartbeat when that smile becomes a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. And so early on in the pandemic, we found from our own work that 45% of America's small businesses had closed. And it really only was through an avalanche of government funding that we avoided the worst feelings of this of this pandemic. Um, looking forward, the even larger question is, 
Will the shift to Zoom, will the telecommuting revolution mean an end to the face-to-face -face contact in offices that made, you know, that actually fueled the demand for cities, the demand for urban real estate? Certainly right now, and this comes from Castle's data, it shows the decline in the share of people going to offices, which really has not come back yet in the US, um, in our densest metropolitan areas. Overall, right, in, in non-urban areas, people are still back in the offices. I'm back in my office, for example. But in our biggest, most expensive office markets, there still are plenty of, of people who aren't coming back at all. Now, this is not the first question that has been asked about whether or not telecommuting will make cities obsolete. Indeed, there's a long dance between technology and cities where some, some technologies like the aqueduct are centripetal that help pull us together. And other technologies like the car or radio or television are centrifugal that enable us to, us to disperse from cities. Indeed, the first time I started thinking about this topic more than 30 years ago, um, I was responding to the futurist Alvin Toffer, who had predicted in his book, The Third Wave, that just as cars and highways had killed off urban industry, had enabled you know, the, the urban garment industry that was built around New York, the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s, had enabled it to disperse, right? So why wouldn't you know, the telecommunications of the 1980s, fax machines, personal computers, kill off urban service workers? And yet they didn't. This is an image of Mike Bloomberg's City Hall, which is based on Bloomberg's company, which is based on the Wallace office in uh, the Bloomberg Trading Company, in the Salomon Brothers Trading Floor, which Bloomberg ran. This is an image of, of Google's campus, right? If you really thought that technology was making face-to-face -face contact obsolete, then why are, were Wallace offices so popular in 2019? Why did Google, which of all the companies in the world should have been able to empower teleworking, and it has during the pandemic, but before the pandemic, that was the last thing that it wanted to do. It brought everyone in, it asked everyone to be right next to each other. And it did so precisely because it recognized that in a world of information intensivity, right? You know, we get smart by being around other smart people. We get creative by being around other smart people. The more complicated an idea is, the easier it is for that idea to be lost in translation, the more important it is for us to be face to face, right? Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students. And that's why this shows a pattern in, in New York pre-COVID. This is the relationship between employment density and annual payroll per employees, right? Massively positive relationship. With, where, where the higher density areas are just vastly more productive than the lower density parts of, of Manhattan. Of course, it's not uniform. There's a strong complementarity between cities and skills. This shows the relationship between earnings across metropolitan areas and the share of the population with a college degree. You know, human capital is the bedrock of individual, urban, and national success. And that's a major reason why Singapore has been such a global success story. Before COVID hit, my primary worry was low density America, was the fact that, you know, over the past uh, 50 years, we've had an increase in the share of prime age male joblessness from five to 15%. And that is disproportionately concentrated in the lower density parts of America, where the urban service economy, the ability to you know, provide basic services, coffee, uh, 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 a taxi cab drive to more skilled people weren't available. And so in many of these areas, more than one in four prime age men were jobless. Now, what does COVID mean for this? Now, it is certainly true that we went remote and for many of us, it was less bad than we thought it would be. But let's not forget what we're losing. This comes from work of Natalia, Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington, um, who look at the uh, impact of productivity on shifting to remote work for call center workers. Um, this echoes earlier work by the great Nicholas Bloom of Stanford University. Both papers find roughly the same thing which is short run productivity doesn't suffer at all. In Bloom's case, it actually goes up. Um, in the long run, however, these workers are much less likely to be, be promoted. What does it mean to be promoted? And that you can see here in the promotion to upper level. It's about, a, it drops in half, in fact. What does it mean to be promoted? Well, to be promoted means that you are, you know, your boss knows that you've become good at handling the difficult calls. You've had an opportunity to learn to be good at doing the difficult calls. How would you learn if you were all by yourself at home? How would your boss learn about you? The information channels that are so rich get shut off when we're not next to one another. Similarly, we've seen nothing but sort of really dismal results from online teaching, right, for younger workers. Um, we've seen that companies are not willing to hire workers when they're gonna be entirely remote. Um, Left-hand side shows workers who have to be live. These are jobs that just can't be done remotely. Here at the onset of the pandemic, big drop in employment, big drop in postings on burning glass technology. So these are basically all the online postings in the US. But by the summer, both postings and jobs had more or less come back. 
flip, flip over to the right side. These are online jobs, jobs that can be done online at least. Um, level of employment stayed much more steady, but the number of postings dropped by 40% and it stayed down. So even though Microsoft told us that it, it's um, workers were just as productive when they went remote, overall postings from Microsoft for, for computer programmers nationwide was down by over 40% between the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2020. Of course, online work has been overwhelmingly a skilled phenomenon. This is May 2020 at the start, uh, at the height of teleworking. At this point in time, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were teleworking. Only 5% of high school dropouts were teleworking. Right? So if you imagine a future that is remote, you're imagining a future that is terrible for less skilled people throughout the world. Now, I don't mean to say that hybrid work isn't here to stay. It is, right? And Zoom has certainly meant that it's easier for people to up and relocate. This is a blessing for cities which can compete on quality of life and a good business environment. This is a tremendous asset for Singapore. It's something to pay attention to, right? That in fact, Singapore can compete for talent in a way that it didn't used to in the past because that talent has become more mobile. I just want to end this by noting that this doesn't change everything, right? It does mean we have to invest in health. I think ideally we would have some kind of an organization like a NATO for health in which Countries would come together, agree to having monitoring, agree to provide aid for developing countries uh, in exchange for their monitoring. Um, but it doesn't change everything in cities. It doesn't change the fact that we are a social species that takes pleasure from being other people and that becomes more productive from being with other people. That is what has made Singapore great. And that is what will make Singapore great in the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Glazer. And on this relatively positive note on the resilience of cities, I would like to move our conversation a little bit back to Singapore. And with that, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Gabriel Lim, Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, to deliver his remarks. Gabriel, please. You know, thank you very much, uh, Junjie. And uh, David, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Um, 50 years ago, then Foreign Minister Rajaratnam delivered his seminal speech on Singapore as a global city. He noted criticisms back then that Singapore would fail because of our small size and our small market. But he argued that we would survive because we were a new kind of city, a, a global city, tapping on the resources, networks, and opportunities of the entire world, and not just within our little red dot. And as it turned out, looking back, uh, Mr. Rajaratnam was right. Uh, Singapore has done very well over the last 50 years. If you look at this chart, our GDP per capita has increased by almost eight times since 1971, uh, from about 10,000 back, uh, back then to about uh, 80,000 today. Uh, this is four times the speed of the OECD and the global average. And aside from GDP per capita, our median wages have risen, productivity have risen. And if you look at Singapore today versus 1971, you can see how we are truly global in our economy, in our workforce, in our culture, as well as in our food. So I think the past 50 years has proven uh, Minister Rajaratnam right. But I'd like to sound a note of caution though, because while we have done well compared to other countries, the comparisons are less flattering when we compare ourselves to other cities. Again, if you look at this next chart, if you look at our GDP versus other global cities, we still lag behind New York, Tokyo, Paris, and London. We're still ahead of some um, Hong Kong and Seoul, for example. Um, besides hard econometrics data, Singapore still lacks some of the intangible attributes that other global cities have, the history of Beijing, cultural heft of Paris, and the diversity of New York as well. And like all city states, Singapore remains inherently vulnerable to the vagaries of our external environment. I was starkly reminded of this in the middle of 2020, in the early stages of the pandemic. Back then, some of you may recall, countries closed their borders and imposed export controls on all manner of items. And for a time, it seemed to us here in MTI that the world had regressed into a sort of a barter economy. Cash was no longer king, and the currency of the day were masks and test kits. And our little sampan felt like driftwood in an open sea. Fortunately, the situation improved after a while, but it was pretty hairy for a time. And so it reminded us that as a small city state, uh, we should never get too complacent or never assume 
that all our problems are solved. So our job is far from done to develop, sing notwithstanding Singapore's progress. I mean, there's a long way to go in terms of continuing to build a vibrant economy, creating good jobs and creating a brighter future for Singaporeans. And in the context of uh, for us to continue to thrive as a city, as an economic space, I want to focus on three attributes. First is connectivity, second is talent, and the third is, for one of a better phrase, uh, the ability to shape the future, Carpe Futura, perhaps. The first, let me touch on uh, connectivity. Today, as you know, we are one of the most connected cities in the world. Uh, we have FTAs with partners that collectively account for more than 90% of global GDP. In a equivalent of the, for those who are familiar with the Singapore PSLE system, 90% gets you achievement level one, which is a very good outcome. Um, besides that, obviously, we are a major air and maritime port and obviously a financial services hub as well, especially for the region. And we are working very hard to strengthen these connections with the global community. For example, even during the pandemic, we continue to sign free trade agreements, two of them, in fact, with the UK and the RCEP. And uh, we are about to sign another one with the Pacific Alliance uh, later this month as well. And we continue to champion multilateralism and plurilateral FTAs throughout the whole process, not just the RCEP, which I mentioned earlier, which is the world's largest uh, FTA, but also the CPTPP and working very closely with the World Trade Organization to maintain multilateralism, free trade, and supply chain connectivity as well. But we're very minded that history is replete with many examples of hyper-connected cities that fell aside by the wayside because they did not adapt to new flows of economic activity, of technology, and of commerce. Just one example was Constantinople. It was a huge hub in the Silk Road between Europe and China. But as shipbuilding technologies improved, as people, um, sailors used a, a compass to be able to navigate the world much more accurately. Um, it allowed European traders to sail further east and trade directly with the Fais, and as a result of that, one contributing factor towards Constantinople's decline. And I think here in Singapore, certainly within MTI, we're very minded that Singapore could easily go the same way if, we're not, um, we, if we do not keep abreast of new technologies and new flows of economic activity. And we are constantly adapting, sensing, and trying to position ourselves for this. And one major new flow is digital or data, right? I mean, uh, the projections vary, but uh, according to several projections, the size of the digital economy in Southeast Asia is projected to go to two, uh, 300 US billion dollars by 2025. That's almost the size of a new Singapore right at our doorstep. McKinsey has also estimated that it will be 50 billion devices connected to the industrial internet of things in the next, by 2025 as well, 50 billion. And so I think as far as Singapore is concerned, to the extent that trade flows and economic activity are reconfiguring themselves around digital and data, we want to position ourselves as a global hub for digital flows by helping to build the digital highways of the future and also helping to shape the digital roads the digital rules of these digital highways. And so we're doing several things, of course, obviously anchoring some of the future technology companies here in Singapore. Even today, 80 out of 100 of the world's top um, digital companies, top 100 digital companies have a presence in Singapore from, the, from Google and Facebook all the way down to Tencent and even homegrown companies like Grab and C Group. Uh, they create today over 200,000 jobs and the number increases by at least 10,000 per year. Uh, we have established digital economy agreements with Australia, uh, David's home country, New Zealand, Chile, and Korea. And we're obviously helping every worker, helping every company adapt to the digital age. And quite fundamentally, we are assiduously digitalizing every aspect of the economy, every sector, every company, and every uh, part of our economy. I'll just give you one example, which is the Port of Singapore Authority, PSA for short. Uh, this is one example where we are combining and integrating digital and analog flows. And I say analog, meaning to say the physical shipment of goods, uh, cargo, obviously. And as an example of how we're doing this across the board for the whole of Singapore. Today, PSA already connects Singapore to over 600 ports in 12, I'm sorry, 600 ports in 120 economies. And PSA has always been a very early adopter of digital technology. Uh, 40 years ago, in the early 80s, they started PortNet, which is a way to, for PSA to connect with the shipping industry, so that it was much more efficient. 
And over time, PSA was able to integrate Portnet with our Singapore custom system so that it wasn't just B2B that was integrated, but B2B2G, G being Singapore, uh, that was also very seamless as well. But PSA is not sitting still. They are building the next, they're taking the next step and they are building an internet of logistics and creating new platforms. They call it Callista, really to allow shippers and cargo owners to track the shipments much more efficiently. So at, in real time, they know where exactly that last pallet that last piece of cargo is around the world. We are going beyond Portnet and uh, Singapore Customs. We are connecting PSA's systems with the government's network trade platform and also the bank's trade financing systems to be able to improve the shipper's experience and allow for trade financing, allow for faster uh, reconciliation of invoices and payments of uh, outstanding bills. And within PSA, within the port itself, uh, using 5G, to really link up all their um, IoT um, devices and equipment so that it can be even more efficient. And I think if we look at how PSA is positioning itself and taking advantage of digital, it gives us a sense of how Singapore can do that across our various sectors as well to really level ourselves up, remain connected and in time for the future. So that's the first part, which is connectivity. Uh, second attribute um, for city success, especially Singapore, is talent, and quite a few have mentioned that, including Professor Glazer. I think the global research is very clear. Economic prosperity is positively related to the education of people and the skills of its workers. And I think in Singapore, we've known that for a very long time. We've had, uh, obviously, a very small population, and we've always taken the view that as people are our only resource, we have much to do to invest in building human capital and upgrading the skills of our workers over and over again. And that is why we have been unrelenting in that focus. But at the same time, I think we also acknowledge that there is a need, especially for a small country, to complement our local workforce with global talent. Uh, foreigners, global talent, they have contributed to economic growth for sure. But beyond economic contributions, they have really created a network of fans and friends who continue to support us to this day, including during the pandemic, when quite a few of them came through to help us uh, during the difficult times. Now. I think while the benefits of talent are clear, I think I just want to acknowledge that there are several challenges to uh, talent flows in this day and age. Uh, the first one is obviously the pandemic, which has forced countries to close their doors to talent and to, to, to people flows in general. But for businesses particularly, making it much more difficult to recruit um, global talent into a country and uh, assimilate them into their companies. I think the closure of borders over the last two years, especially in the first six months, has been unprecedented in the scale and duration. I think it has clearly deprived economies of talent, workers, tourists, people, which has had a disproportionate effect on talent and regional hubs like Singapore. And I think that's why, as far as we are concerned, we are working to open our borders safely. Obviously, our uh, ubiquitous vaccination has helped give us the assurance that our people are protected, and that's very fundamental. But beyond that, also opening our borders through vaccinated travel lanes, I mean, I think they have helped restore some flows but at the same time, we are still so far below pre-COVID levels that I think we have a long way to go. And we are working hard to try to resume general vaccinated travel in as safe a way as possible, because really our position as a hub city depends on this in a big way. So the first one is the pandemic, but the second challenge to talent flows is also technology. I think Professor Glazer mentioned that how Zoom has facilitated mobile working and given uh, global talent really a lot more choices in terms of where they want to base themselves. I think uh, there is an argument out there that actually there are no reason for people to work in cities if they can work anywhere with a data link. Uh, I take a slightly different view, I beg to differ. I think uh, the studies are showing that even though, uh, as Professor Glazer said, short-term productivity may not suffer too much from remote working, there is growing evidence that the longer-term costs are higher. Obviously, at an individual level, mental health, anxiety is uh, becoming increasing concerns. But at the societal level, at a company level, you will definitely have issues with pertaining to things like teamwork, camaraderie, innovation, because these oftentimes arise when people get together with people, they're able to brainstorm, they're able to thrash out ideas, and they're able, more importantly, to build their interpersonal relationships that are so fundamental and so key to successful businesses and obviously to cohesive societies as well. So I think for Singapore, <clears throat> the question is not whether technology will erode our position as a talent hub, but rather whether Singapore can reinvent ourselves and strengthen our value proposition so that we are the best place for people who can really work anywhere 
to live, work and play here in Singapore. And also for businesses who want to convene teams, who want to meet, who want to hold conferences, to be able to choose Singapore to do so safely in a way that supports their overall objectives as well. And I think there's something that Singapore can work out and we will, we will be able to adapt to in the post-pandemic world. Obviously, a major, within this broad context, a major factor underpinning Singapore's competitiveness is our attitude towards global talent. I know this is something that is uh, quite sensitive. There is a significant amount of anxiety arising from competition. Uh, and this is happening around the world. And as a result of that, there's a certain sense that I think we have to try to close ourselves off. But I think the best way to overcome these anxieties is really to not so much to close ourselves off to competition from around the world, but really to find a way to level up our capabilities, deepen our skills so that we can compete and we can then find the right balance to be able to complement our local workforce with global talent. And to this extent, I mean, we're doing quite a lot of things, as you know, we are adjusting our manpower policies to find the right balance between openness and assurance for our workers. We are strengthening institutional support to upgrade our workers' skills. These pictures show uh, some of the programs under our SG United Jobs and Skills program, which is one of the world's most comprehensive programs for skills upgrading and education throughout one's life. And by several metrics, Singapore is one of the top spenders globally in lifelong learning per person. And I think that there's a commitment that we will have, we'll make, and we will honor to our workers to help them to uh, be ready for the future and to be ready for the competition from the world over. And I think with this, with our pillar of tripartism, I'm quite confident that we can strike that better balance to be able to serve our workers, but also our companies who choose to make Singapore their home as well. And therefore, I, certainly within MTI, we hope that even as the pandemic may have forced us to temporarily close our borders to global talent, we hope that our measures will ensure that Singapore will never close our hearts and minds to global talent in the long term. So this, the final attribute I want to talk about is the ability to shape the future. And this is something that all cities have had. Uh, Prof Glazer talked about how the Athenians were involved in shaping the future of societies, the future of democracy, the intellectual thought behind how uh, societies are organized. And I think in, for us, for Singapore to thrive as a global city, we must be able, our people must be able to shape the future on issues that matter most to the world. And there are many, by the way. Yeah. But one of the most critical things, one of the most existential issues in the world today is the issue of sustainability. Right. It is a global challenge. It is a challenge for humanity. And I say that cities play a pivotal role in the, in the current climate crisis. Today, cities account for over two thirds of the world's energy and emit 60% of greenhouse gases. And various reports show that cities will be hardest hit by climate change. And I think in Singapore, this is especially true. Almost a third of our island today uh, lies less than five meters above mean sea level. And if sea levels rise faster than scientists project, as is increasingly possible, Actually, you might find many parts of Singapore underwater. I was just musing that today's beach road may actually one day revert to being alongside the beach instead of alongside Marina Square and alongside this beautiful um, city centre that we have downtown. So I think Singapore can play a leading role in developing solutions for the climate crisis. And this is really the intent behind the Singapore Green Plan, which we launched uh, last year, uh, really to set up a holistic approach, not just spanning businesses and, and workers and individuals, but really engaging the entire population in this shared challenge. Uh, we already have a broad-based carbon tax, which we implemented three years ago. And next month, uh, we will be announcing the revised post-2023 carbon tax level uh, to set ourselves up for the future. The MAS, our monetary authority, our central bank, is leading the way in green financing, which is a key enabler for transition to a sustainable future. We are scaling our efforts to develop a carbon credit trading marketplace. We are investing significantly in R&D in the future technologies to be able to decarbonize the world, including through carbon capture uh, and uh, decarbonization. And also, we have started piloting green economy agreements to complement the digital economy agreements uh, in, in order to increase the focus of sustainability across our existing trade architecture. Now, I, we are obviously determined to work with all partners, our foreign uh, partners, our, obviously our people, our young. This is a high stakes issue. We need to get sustainability right for our future generations. But I also want to say that this will be a very difficult transition. We are under no illusions about how easy it will be. Uh, on various fronts, the clean energy infrastructure is currently not quite ready. The renewables are intermittent by, this def by its very definition, and other alternative technologies like hydrogen are still, at this current moment, 
quite expensive. Um, as the recent energy crunch showed, um, we need to pace the energy transition carefully because you want to avoid significant economic shocks and hardships. And uh, I think at the end of the day, while businesses obviously need to transform, to decarbonize, to completely revisit their business models, actually consumers must too. And it goes beyond using metal straws or reusable tote bags, but rather being prepared to change their way of life, being prepared to pay more for a cleaner, greener world. And I think this is something that we will have to work on together. But if there is one city or one country that can get this right, to turn adversity into opportunity, I, I'm hopeful that Singapore can be one of those cities. And we can do with sustainability what we've done with water and hopefully set the example for the rest of the world. And more importantly, be a platform for global solutions to be invented and develop out of Singapore. So I've spoken about connectivity, talent, and the ability to shape the future. I just want to end by just saying very briefly that I've really shared these comments in the context of Singapore as an economic space. But in truth, a city cannot be an econo just an economic space, more so a country and a city state like Singapore. I think we must also, as uh, Minister Ong said on Friday, we must also be an inclusive society, a home for all peoples, and really a members, that sense of cohesion, a members of a close-knit tribe sharing a common fate and destiny because that sense of cohesion and unity is what will take Singapore forward for many more years to come. And I hope that we can do this. I hope that we will continue to have that Singapore spirit to have that sense of verve, that sense of optimism, that sense of daring do, or as the Singapore Bicentennial showed us, that sense of self-determination that we can, as a city, achieve together. And I think that if we're able to do that, then Minister Raja Ratnam's predictions from 1972 uh, would hopefully last us for yet another 50 years and beyond. And we can look back one day at SG100 and continue to celebrate Singapore's progress and show that Singapore can overcome the odds as a city-state and continue to do well as a city, as an economic space globally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for giving us this very wide-ranging and deep uh, set of remarks for really situating us not just in economic space, but in the social, broader social cultural context as well. And also for continuing on this, um, this mood of cautious optimism. So on this note, I would like to now hand over the floor to Dr. David Skilling. David, please. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with you uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to offer some remarks on uh, Singapore in the post-COVID global economy. Uh, Singapore clearly uh, is a city, a city-state. It's also a small economy. And so although the framing for today's session uh, is around cities, uh, I would also like to bring in uh, a small advanced economy perspective to provide some insight uh, into uh, Singapore's performance uh, and also its outlook uh, going forward. Uh, I'm going to structure my remarks around a few observations. Firstly, just looking at the reasons for the historical performance of uh, small economies uh, like Singapore. Uh, secondly, just some reflections on how small economies, including Singapore, have performed uh, through the pandemic over the last uh, 18 months or two years. Uh, and then lastly, some observations on uh, how cities and small economies can expect to perform given the structural changes uh, that have been accelerated and strengthened uh, through uh, the pandemic. Now, I'd like to start uh, just by some uh, reflections and observations on the factors that have supported the strong performance of Singapore uh, and other small economies over the last uh, few decades. In a sense, the economic performance of Singapore needs no rehearsing. Gabrielle's slides, I think, remind us of how well Singapore has done uh, on measures like GDP growth converging to the capita uh, income frontier. Singapore, of course, has a particular uh, economic model. But if you strip away many of the surface differences, it turns out that uh, the reasons that have driven Singapore's success are really not that different than those that have driven the performance of other successful uh, small advanced economies. And I would point to uh, three factors uh, in particular. Uh, one is that there has been over the last uh, several decades a very supportive uh, global environment. It's been a period of intense globalization, strong global flows of trade, uh, capital, uh, people, and small economies have leveraged that uh, incredibly well. Clearly that's been uh, at the core of the Singapore economic model uh, as well. Uh, in a sense, that's uh, good luck. Uh, Singapore's independence happened, if you like, uh, at the right time. But nevertheless, small economies and, and cities like Singapore have been able to leverage uh, that strong process of, of, of sort of strong global flows. 
But the second factor is around uh, intrinsics, uh, strong social and political institutions, effective governments, uh, social capital, social trust that enable governments, enable uh, other economic agents to make uh, strong, high-quality decisions. Uh, in many countries, that's more or less exogenous. It's a, it's a given. Uh, in Singapore's case, of course, it was a, a function, it was a, 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 a locus of uh, strong policy attention as well. But this is one thing that marks out small economies, very strong political uh, and social institutions. But above the kind of the, the good luck of, of global flows and the, the intrinsics of, of strong institutions, the thing that's really marked successful city-states and small economies out uh, is high-quality, deliberate policy choices. They have figured out how to position themselves uh, in the global economy uh, to successful uh, ends. Singapore, of course, has, has done that uh, very, very well. Uh, one thing I do is I create what's called an economic strength index. It tries to identify the factors that explain variation in per capita income uh, across small economies. Uh, and the thing that comes through that exercise very, very powerfully is that successful small economies are those that are deeply internationally engaged, that have developed positions of strong global competitive advantage, in general through heavy investment in skills in human capital, uh, but also in innovation. And these are dimensions clearly on which Singapore's economic model uh, is very soundly based. Very strong investment uh, in human capital, as Gabriel mentioned, very strong investment in R&D, in universities, uh, in research intensive firms. Uh, and so for cities and for small economies that are able to develop these leading positions in many areas of economic activity and use that to overcome the bounds of a small domestic market, that's where success uh, has lied. But that, of course, doesn't happen by good fortune. It's a matter of heavy, sustained uh, policy uh, intervention. I think this is one reason that Singapore has become such a successful global city. It, it's also uh, useful, I think, to reflect on what that means for Singapore uh, as a city. Uh, if you compare Singapore and Hong Kong, Hong Kong, of course, being another uh, successful city-state with a, an economic model, but it's not too dissimilar uh, than that of Singapore in terms of heavy reliance on intermediating global flows, uh, a home for, for, for global capital. Uh, and yet it's become increasingly apparent that there are uh, significant differences between the Singapore policy model uh, and the Hong Kong policy model. Uh, Singapore has invested, yes, in being a hub. Um, over the last several sessions in this conference, many have remarked on Singapore's role uh, as a hub, uh, on arbitraging opportunities, on attracting labour and capital to Singapore. And of course, that is one important element of Singapore's success. It is a strong global hub. But I think one thing that distinguishes Singapore from other city states, including Dubai, including uh, Hong Kong, is it's become a platform. It's invested very heavily in domestic strengths that enable uh, factors of production, be it labour, capital, to be successful in Singapore, enable Singapore to create or to capture more economic value from these global flows. Uh, and if you look, as I said, at the R&D investment, the human capital investment, the ability to develop strong clusters of economic activity in Singapore, these are factors that distinguish Singapore from other global cities uh, like Hong Kong. That is much more an intermediary for global flows, particularly into, into mainland China, but with much less of a presence in terms of R&D uh, innovation. Uh, and so just as one summary statistic, if you look at manufacturing activity as a share of GDP, which is where a lot of innovation occurs, Singapore has manufacturing to GDP of about 20%. In Hong Kong, it's less than 1%. Much of the, the manufacturing activity has left Hong Kong uh, and relocated across the border uh, into Shenzhen, uh, to Guangdong, uh, and other parts of, of mainland China. Uh, and that reduces the amount of resilience. It reduces the degree of, uh, of optionality, I suppose, uh, in Hong Kong uh, compared to Singapore. So Singapore, in addition to being you know, a city state, a city like uh, uh, Hong Kong, London, New York, it's very heavily reliant uh, on the services economy, has deliberately diversified. It's more of a small economy, if you like, in addition to simply being a city. And I think that's, that positions uh, Singapore uh, to significant advantage uh, going forward. And as I said, that's a consequence of deliberate and sustained investment uh, in things like R&D, uh, developing uh, deep clusters. Uh, and so I think that offers some, uh, a foundation, if you like, for providing some perspectives on Singapore uh, going forward. Um, the, the second set of uh, observations just about small economies uh, through the pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic has dominated most aspects uh, of our global, of our social uh, and economic life uh, over the last 18 months or two years. But I think it's instructive to reflect on how small economies have performed over that period compared to other larger uh, advanced economies. And in general, it's a pretty positive 
uh, an encouraging measure uh, message in terms of health outcomes, although obviously there's a, a wide degree of variation. Uh, many small economies, Singapore included, uh, have outperformed uh, in terms of keeping very tight control on COVID. Singapore, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, uh, and many others have done incredibly well. Uh, and even within Europe, uh, where it's, it's quite a different story, if you like, than, uh, than Asia in terms of cases and deaths. But even there, small economies have outperformed larger economies uh, like the UK, like Italy, in terms of control uh, of cases uh, and deaths. That's partly uh, due to good health policy, but it's also due to, broad, to strong, broader political management, the strong political intrinsics that I was mentioning uh, earlier. Uh, and from an economic perspective, it's instructive, I think, that small economies have outperformed larger economies in terms of uh, GDP, in terms of employment, in terms of exporting performance. Uh, small economies have, at least in a relative sense, uh, had a good uh, pandemic. That's partly a function of uh, the good health management, uh, the ability to inject fiscal support uh, into their uh, economies, uh, but also the resilience of global flows. One of the uh, encouraging aspects for the last 18 months is just how resilient uh, merchandise trade flows have been. And for small economies and cities that are deeply exposed to the global economy, that's been enormously helpful in providing a measure of economic resilience to their economic performance uh, through COVID. Now, obviously, for uh, small economies that are exposed to international tourism flows like Singapore, uh, like New Zealand, indeed, like Hong Kong and others, uh, there's been you know, a significant hit, but that's been compensated for by many other uh, strong uh, elements of the COVID uh, economic uh, performance. Uh, and so if you like the, the pandemic, although it's been very harsh in a health and social economic uh, perspective, offers, I think, quite a useful illustration of many of the strengths of small economies, both in terms of their uh, intrinsics, political and social, but also in terms of the underlying resilience uh, of the economic models. It's common to write the obituaries of small economies when the global economy has a hiccup. But it turns out actually that small economies in city states like Singapore are remarkably resilient because they, on a sustained basis, make high quality policy choices. Now, of course, the pandemic is not simply an 18 month or two year phenomenon. Uh, it is also a deeply structural phenomenon. And it is going to have, I think, enduring uh, effects on uh, global economic, business, technology uh, dynamics. Uh, and small economies and cities, uh, because of their exposure to these external dynamics, need to be very, very thoughtful about what this means for uh, the setting of policy uh, going forward and for the way in which they position uh, in the global economy to make sure the success that we have enjoyed over the last three, four, five decades uh, can be sustained uh, going forward. There are, of course, any number of structural dynamics that you could look to uh, coming out of uh, the pandemic. Uh, I will just point to a few that I think are particularly instructive uh, from uh, a small advanced economy uh, perspective. Uh, the first is that uh, the nature of globalization uh, is changing. Uh, it's not ending, it's not reversing, but it is changing, I think, in quite powerful ways. Uh, it's becoming increasingly regional and local. Uh, I think that's partly due to technology, uh, like automation that allows activities to be brought closer to the consumer. It's partly commercial factors. The era of far-flung supply chains because of low-cost labour is clearly ending. Uh, but it's also, there's some political and geopolitical factors there as well. Strategic autonomy, resilience of supply chains and like. And so location is going to matter even more. And so small economies to perform in this world where global flows might not be quite as intense, need to pay even more attention to being distinctive having very strong positions of competitive advantage that are based on investments in R&D and human capital in broader social and economic uh, infrastructure. So small economies need to adjust to these new patterns of global flows. Shifting global economic geography, uh, it's a point that uh, Ed Glazer made uh, in his remarks. You know, Singapore, I think, is on, on net advantaged. People have more choices in terms of where they locate, how they locate, hybrid models are being adopted. Uh, and so for uh, locations for cities that are able to uh, you know, have a very strong value, you know, sort of uh, value proposition around quality of life, as well as around commercials like tax rates and, and the like. I, I think there are real opportunities you know, as economic activity moves away from some of the large nodes to a more distributed um, uh, profile. Uh, and then lastly, I think small economies need to be really attentive to shifting business models and growth sectors. Small economies and city states tend to be heavily concentrated on particular sectors. So it's a very heavy sectoral concentration. Uh, and so the extent that we see changes in those, small economies need to be very agile and fleet-footed in, in terms of responding. Uh, Gabriel mentioned in his remarks, climate change. 
uh, it's a significant environmental issue. But also through the pandemic, we've seen significant shifts in consumer preferences, investor preferences indeed, in terms of their attitudes towards the emissions intensity of goods and services. We've also seen new technologies. And so for small economies, it's really, really important to be undertaking, if you like, an assessment and audit of how they are exposed to some of these shifting uh, consumer preferences, uh, shifting business models, shifting technologies to ensure that although they are you know, concentrated on particular areas, that they are able to adjust and adapt uh, and they're not going to get broadsided by some of these uh, shifting uh, preferences uh, and technologies. You know, I've been discussing many of these uh, in my, my regular uh, writings, my regular notes, but in, in, and they are, I think, deeply structural, they are deeply meaningful, uh, and they will play out significantly over the next several decades, several years and beyond. But on net, I remain quite positive on the small economy uh, and city outlook. You know, for one thing, I think they have a record through a pandemic of performing well. I think modern economic history also suggests that small economies, uh, including Singapore, are very agile and responsive in terms of adapting themselves to uh, new realities uh, in the global economy. One thing that I think that small economies have, which is sometimes painful, uh, is also a very limited margin for error. They get the message very quickly when things are shifting. Uh, and I think you know, through various crises, be it the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, Singapore has commonly been one of the fastest moving uh, small economies, indeed economies full stop, uh, to respond. And I think we'll need to bring that to the table uh, going forward. Uh, so I remain very confident that small economies can adapt, uh, can respond to some of these post-COVID realities. Uh, I think Singapore can as well. Uh, but I think my, my closing message is that to sustain the success that small economies in Singapore have enjoyed over the last several decades, we will need to adapt. Uh, we will need to build uh, economic models that are fit for purpose for this new post-COVID world. We will need to build platforms as opposed to hubs that simply intermediate flows. And we will need to continue to, to invest. But if we do that, uh, then I remain very, very confident uh, that small economies that Singapore will prosper going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now we are going to move into the Q&A segment and the questions are slowly coming in. Uh, from what I see, there are two broad clusters of questions that are appearing. One focuses on Singapore's competitiveness, its competitive advantage. Another focuses on who gets left behind amidst this process. So in, in line with what we've been discussing, shall we start with the competitive advantage bit first before we move inwards into the domestic economic aspects? So broadly speaking, uh, there's a lot of questions about Singapore's competitive advantages and unique selling points. This question comes from Mr. Christopher Gee from IPS. And he asked the question of how do we maintain our competitive advantage, especially in digital connectivity? Um, he, he mentions that it is relatively easy for other cities to also put similar sort of digital uh, infrastructure in place. So what makes us competitive in, the, in that space? Uh, may, uh, thanks, uh, Jin Jia. I'll maybe try to take that. Sure. Uh, uh, it is indeed true. I mean, Christopher did raise a very important point. It is indeed true that other cities or other countries may have more land, for example, fewer carbon constraints or lower cost labor to be able to make some of these things work. But I would say that there are quite a few issues that uh, we should not uh, underestimate our strengths in. Uh, for digitalization, I mean, the connectivity part is uh, quite important. I think here in Singapore, in terms of the, the fact that we have... Um, uh, we are actually hyper-connected when it comes to submarine landing cables, for example, when it comes to our under national fiber network is a significant advantage. I think trust is also a significant advantage. I mean, the companies where we engage, the tech companies do tell us that one big uh, reason they're here is because they, they, they have trust in not just the fact that uh, we are uh, essentially a, a reliable uh, government with consistent policies that are not going to change at a whim and fancies, but also really that over here we are neutral. And I think that's also very important going forward. And I think the last thing I would say if, uh, with regards to, and I'll just maybe um, sort of reference David's very important point. I think when it comes to digital and when it comes to technology, ours is a government that that gets it. I mean, I think we are pro-science. We understand how technology, the impact of technology, we understand it. We understand how it's uh, able to change the world, is how it's able to shape societies. And, and as, as a result of that, I think we are then able to bring a very balanced, progressive approach to engaging companies in terms of being able to 
address their needs, but at the same time, making sure that we protect some of our own uh, social considerations uh, and uh, to do so in a way that's mutually beneficial for both sides. And I think this is something that, these are some, some of the few strengths that we have that should not be underestimated that also allow us at the end of the day to constantly fight for uh, you know, uh, our place in the sun uh, in spite of lower cost competitors around the world. Thanks. David? Yeah, just, just a couple of uh, uh, observations. I, I very much agree with what uh, Gabriel just said. I would also say that, you know, developing strengths, be it in the digital economy or other areas of activity, you need to take, if you like, a, a cluster-based approach. You've got to have many things that are right. It's not simply a matter of having low-cost labour uh, or good infrastructure. It's a matter of putting a whole range of things uh, together. Uh, and in a sense, Singapore has a measure of first-mover advantage. It's been doing this for, for quite some time. Uh, and so having a pool of human capital, uh, both domestic uh, and the ability to uh, tap on foreign talent, having very, very strong research universities with uh, innovation uh, sort of focus. Uh, for the work that I do points very strongly to uh, universities, very strong research universities being critical to the success uh, of national performance, particularly in knowledge intensive activities, which the digital economy uh, clearly is one, as well as the broader uh, business environment the MNCs that are located uh, in Singapore. And the ability to kind of bring all those things together is really, really important. Singapore's been doing this for, for quite some time, as well as the hard infrastructure uh, as well. Uh, and we'll continue to adapt to, to move into new spaces. And so I think the, the message is just to keep on doing what you have been doing, just do it faster and, uh, and, and more of it to keep that uh, edge. I think the other thing about small economies, it's sometimes said that in an era of kind of platform companies and increasing returns to scale, that small economies are going to get squeezed out. We don't have the Facebooks, we don't have the Googles, and so there's no value for us. Now, I think the, the record is that's just not really true. I mean, yes, Facebook and Google and Amazon are, have done remarkably well and generate enormous amounts of, of value. But the record also suggests that for small economies like Singapore, you can, if you like, win in the margins. You don't need to capture 100% of a market. You can do very well by focusing on high margin niches uh, in which you can do very, very well. So I think focus on what you do well, invest heavily and make sure that you keep the overall kind of cluster functioning. Uh, and I think in a small economy like Singapore, it's much easier to get your arms around all of the dimensions of the cluster than it is in some of the large jurisdictions. And I think Singapore actually shows that, they just need to keep on, on doing it. Thank you. Thank you, David. And these are really important points when we talk about clustering, being attractive to global business. And this allows us to sort of uh, segue into two sets of very uh, two sets of top voted questions. And the first one is a broad question. And would either of you be able to comment on who gets left behind in Singapore's pursuit to become a global city and an economic hub? And I would throw up a very related question as well, anonymous question that while Singapore attracts more MNCs, how do we ensure that these MNCs are employing Singaporeans, ensuring that locals have a a share of the pie, and what are some of the ways we can improve this balance between creating opportunities for Singaporeans and also tapping on the global talent pool that, that we really very much need for our continued economic growth. So I think these two sets of questions throw up a, a very broad uh, question about uh, balancing benefits between local and, and global talent pool. Um. Uh, should I go first again? Sure. Up. Okay, um, a very important question. I just want to say very clearly one thing. I mean, obviously in MTI here, we are, uh, uh, the, the most important thing for us is basically to grow the economy. But I just want to assure all the, everyone listening in and the members of the public out there that we're not just these very mercenary uh, people that really at the end of the day, we understand, we understand that at the end of the day, all of us here are involved in nation building. And really the only way to build a nation is to make sure that it's inclusive, that people see in Singapore a home for, and, and, it's, and it's, it's united, it's cohesive. And that's critical. So we are very clearly um, working towards making sure that the vulnerable um, are going to be uh, protected and are going to be able to give us support to be able to address the competition from the world over. 
And these will be those who are maybe who are lesser skilled, those who may have a disability, for example. And just to make sure that in our efforts to uh, upgrade and upskill our workers, we pay special attention to them to give them additional leg up. And obviously not just from a training perspective, but even in you know, our social support and our community care, that this is something that we pay special attention to. I do, however, do want to say that it, I don't quite um, agree that if we do not um, try to develop as a global city, that there will be fewer people left behind. I think actually, in fact, recessions have typically shown that those who are uh, lower skilled and everything actually tend to be disproportionately affected. And it was certainly true during the pandemic as well. So it is it, the, the counterfactual isn't necessarily true. I think what's important for us is to continue to maintain that uh, focus on growth, but at the same time, making a special effort to on redistribution, making sure that it is more inclusive and giving everyone a greater share of their prosperity. And that can be done in a multitude of ways. I'm quite sure across the entire conference, there have been quite a lot of discussions about this. And on, on the second question of MNCs and making sure they hire locals, I mean, a couple of things. One, I mean, as you can see, actually, our unemployment rate remains very low. And in fact, it is recovering. It's not quite back to pre-COVID levels, unlike our GDP, but it is recovering. Uh, and we are cautiously optimistic, I don't want to hex it, that we will get back to pre-COVID levels fairly soon. And I think what we, we've been working very carefully, I mean, the National Jobs Council, for example, uh, chaired by SM Tharman, has been uh, sort of driving this together, obviously, with agencies, the Manpower Ministry, and so on and so forth, but really trying to make sure that we are doing, um, giving our locals every opportunity to not just to get employment, which is being done, but also to continue to grow and to rise within those organizations or within the region. And I think that's something we are continuing to do. Like I said, it starts with skills, but it starts from also making sure that the market works much more efficiently. And it also extends to working with the companies, whether it's MNCs or large local enterprises, just to make sure that they are um, also focus on growing local timber, so to speak, and giving their locals a full opportunity to uh, get pro to get to progress and to get promoted as well. So uh, this is something that uh, we are taking very seriously, and it's part and parcel of how we want to, to build a global city, but not just a city global city as an economic space. But that was my point. But really, a, a global a country, a city state, a place where we can all call home, and a place where we know we stand alongside one another in solidarity and in cohesion with one another. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, just a couple of uh, thoughts for me on the, um, the inclusion uh, point. You know, from an international perspective, one of the striking aspects of successful small economies, and I'm thinking here particularly of the, the Northern Europeans, the Nordics, Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, and the like, is that they have coupled very strong performance economically, high per capita incomes, strong productivity performance, with very strong outcomes in terms of inclusive growth, uh, be that Gini coefficient income distribution, uh, social mobility, uh, employment, uh, and the like. So there's no necessary trade-off. Indeed, you know, many small economies have deliberately constructed models that simultaneously achieve economically uh, and on other uh, social dimensions. Uh, in Singapore, I think, is, is not that dissimilar. I mean, its income distribution numbers are often cited as being not quite in line. But if you look at employment numbers, as Gabriel just mentioned, very strong participation in employment rates, uh, very strong wage growth, particularly among uh, uh, lower-income uh, folk, uh, Singapore performs very well in terms of uh, wealth distribution because of its housing policy. So, you know, I would say that it is really important to be thinking about the way in which you marry uh, drive for economic performance uh, with that inclusive growth dimension. One, it gives you social license. If people, if the, the growth uh, is broadly shared, it enables governments to pursue open markets uh, more aggressively uh, and on a more sustained basis. And I think that's a real, one of the real lessons from small economies is you need to do both simultaneously. And I think that's uh, become even more apparent uh, through a pandemic. Uh, and I think the, the adjacent point uh, to that is that the complication for Singapore is that Singapore is both simultaneously a, a country uh, and a city. And I'm uh, just reflecting back on uh, Gabriel's charts on, yes, Singapore may have done well in terms of uh, beating most of advanced economies in terms of per capita income, perhaps lagging uh, the Londons and the New Yorks. But I think that's more or less uh, inevitable. Uh, London and, and New York can focus on per capita income, heavily services oriented, don't need to worry so much about income distribution or cost of living because people can exit quite easily for other lower cost areas of those respective countries in a way that Singaporeans uh, simply can't. Uh, and so I think, you know, although there is value in benchmarking Singapore against London and New York and the things that you can certainly learn, there are also dangers as well because on some dimensions, Singapore simply can't replicate uh, those uh, policies. It doesn't have the degrees of freedom and it needs to be much more mindful about a more packaged measure uh, of, of outcomes 
uh, better disaster. So Singapore, I feel, has the best of both worlds in terms of being a country and a city, uh, or in some cases, the challenges of both worlds. And I think balancing that is, is really, really important. Uh, just very, very uh, quickly in, in closing on the second point, I think one of the issues for Singapore, you know, having run very successfully an MNC heavy model over the last, well, sort of over its post-independence period, I think now Singapore has got to a period, a sort of position where to capture more value, trying to grow more of its domestic economies, having more successful Singaporean firms uh, growing into global markets aggressively, you know, offers a way to capture more economic value uh, from the global economy. Yes, FDI will continue to be an important source of ideas and capital and, and knowledge, uh, but supplementing that model in a more balanced way with growing more Singaporean firms, uh, I think is really important, both from an economic perspective, uh, but also in terms of creating more opportunities for uh, the Singapore core, if you like, of labour markets. Uh, and I think policy is, is tracking in that direction. Thank you, David. And if you don't mind, I would like to pick on that last point a little bit, because there is a question from Carol Tan Fujita, who asks about how do we balance between our MNC-centric uh, policy uh, strategy so far, as well as our desire to grow our local ecosystem, our SMEs, our smaller enterprises, this takes time, she says, and requires resources and may well be costly in the short term. So how, I, I suppose this question is posed towards Gabriel, how is the government thinking about balancing between SMEs, MNCs, and, and perhaps David could chime in as well? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, it's, it's something that, uh, I mean, we're trying very hard to do. I mean, we have been putting in place more and more, as a government, I think, putting in place more and more schemes to really help some of our more promising local enterprises take the next step to become, first of all, SMEs to become mid-sized enterprises or startups, first of all, to launch and become uh, 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 small companies for them to grow and then after that for them possibly to become global champions. I mean, I think that we'll just have to continue to do this. I mean, the in terms of financial and capital support, that's really not an issue. It's actually, um, it's the, the, there is liquidity out there, there is financial support out there. But I think what we can do a lot better job is in terms of uh, working together with them to partner some of the leading companies just to make sure that there's a capability transfer, uh, which is, was something that was quite, uh, I mean, really in the first wave of uh, foreign investments into Singapore in the 60s and 70s, I mean, all of the local companies that got um, plugged into this MNC ecosystem subsequently became fairly prominent companies or global or regional companies in their own right. And in a, likewise, um, I think we can try to use that model to uh, diversify and to grow our own local companies. And the last thing I want to say is also that I think we can do a, also a better job in terms of building future corporate leaders with a global mindset and a global ambition to really take these companies to the next level. And that means getting Singaporeans much more attuned to working regionally or globally, especially in Asia. Oftentimes when we speak to companies, one of the things they feedback to us is actually they uh, paradoxically find that uh, many Singaporeans know more about New York and Shanghai than Jakarta and Manila. And, and it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a paradox because that's really, I think Southeast Asia, for example, is one of the growth engines for the future. And I think we need to be able to try to get, find more ways to encourage Singaporeans to go overseas, understand the region a lot better, and to the extent that it continues to be an important engine of growth for the future, then use that experience and that opportunities to become, uh, to rise up in terms of the corporate rankings, to be able to lead companies into the next growth phase and hopefully take that position on the world stage in time to come as well. Uh, this is something I think uh, as, a, and as a ministry, we've announced quite a few plans over the last few years and we're tracking this quite carefully and we're working quite closely with uh, the various other parties to do this. And yeah, I'm quite confident that we will, we will succeed, but it does take time. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess I just want to add to that. I think the ability to, to supplement the uh, FDI heavy model with a much greater proportion of uh, large uh, growing uh, Singapore firms that are active in regional and global markets is really, really important for Singapore's performance in a post-COVID global economy where there are shifts in the pattern of global flows, MNCs are making different decisions, often becoming more lo local and regional. Uh, and so I think from a resilience standpoint, uh, from a value capture standpoint, having more Singapore firms that are aggressively growing into global markets uh, is a really, really important policy priority. Uh, I suppose the caution, though, that I would offer is that this is not a straightforward thing to do. As, as Gabriel was intimating, this is not news. Uh, it just turns out this is quite difficult uh, to do. Uh, you know, the, the you know, ability to bring local firms into the supply chains of MNCs, for example, has shifted enormously from the 60s and 70s. Supply chains now are deeply sophisticated, very, very complicated, and often it's just not realistic for a firm 
in Singapore to be able to be supplying inputs uh, into a semiconductor uh, uh, foundry or high-end pharmaceuticals. And so that kind of disjunct between the MNC part of the supply chain and what local firms are doing is acute. You see that also in countries like Ireland, uh, also very successful in terms of attracting FDI, uh, but has really struggled to grow the kind of domestic champions, uh, if you like, despite much policy attention and effort. So this is important, uh, but it's not straightforward. I, I suspect it's becoming increasingly ch challenging to do. So I think the takeaway uh, is you need to solve for that by sustained creative policy effort. Uh, yes, some, uh, some monetary support, some policy support, uh, some uh, capability building, but also, as I said uh, earlier, you know, deliberately building clusters around key areas of economic strength that can uh, apprentice uh, these firms, these Singapore firms, uh, and, and grow them. So uh, I don't pretend this is easy to do. Uh, it's not easy in a Singapore context or anywhere else. Uh, but I think it's, it's critically important uh, and will need to be seen as a, if you like, a, a long-term uh, policy priority. Thank you. Thank you, David and Gabriel. And I think the, these dynamics are perhaps most evident in the, in the tech space where there has been a lot of disruption, a lot of startups and a lot of opportunities for the smaller firms to really carve a niche for themselves. And on that note, there are a cluster of questions that focus on our digital economy, our remote working, and I'll try to summarize uh, two or three of them together. So uh, a question from Eunice O and Jan Lee talked about, they picked on Professor Edward Glazer's comments about hybrid work versus face-to-face -face work. And the question really is about, as we move towards remote working, organizations do not need to rely on the local workforce, but they can employ skilled workers from overseas. And how do we continue to secure good jobs for locals, even as we tap on this global remote uh, pool of talent? So that, that, is, um, that is the crux of the question. And I think there are, more, there are several questions on remote working that are somewhat clustered around the same question of protecting locals, helping them to compete effectively, so perhaps Gabriel could kick us off. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Jintia. I think um, it is a, definitely a big issue. I think the first and most important uh, starting point is indeed the realization that with digitalization, actually, it is possible for more jobs, not all jobs, or more jobs to be done remotely. And even as we may accelerate the flexibility of working from home, I think we need to think carefully about whether or not the same job can be done overseas and not in Singapore. And I think once you realize and come, once you have that realization, I think then the onus to make sure that at the individual level, you have the skills and the capabilities to, to basically uh, continue to do the job uh, is it is quite fundamental because if, if we become as a as a people as a workforce we become complacent or we start to assume that jobs are uh, we're entitled to certain jobs i think that would be uh, obviously not a very good approach to have but if we believe that we need to continue to upgrade continue to improve ourselves continue to make it worth companies while to create jobs here in singapore in partnership with us because they benefit and so do we then i think we have a good starting point for continued economic success. But as I said, quite apart from the individual level, as I said in my remarks, I think as a country and as an economy, I think we can certainly focus then on the areas which would then draw talent, uh, both local as well as global, to basically physically base themselves in Singapore. And why is that important? As I mentioned before, I think it's really about the ability to interact, to brainstorm, to thrash out ideas, to innovate together. It's a crossroads, a meeting, the intersection of these various um, mindsets and approaches that I think is quite critical. Uh, and as I personally like to say, you know, nobody goes to uh, watch a football match at a stadium and comes away thinking that the TV broadcast was better. You want to be where the action is. You want that shared experience of, of, of working alongside your, your colleague, your teammate, and really creating something and winning together. I think that's absolutely critical. So what will be, I think, as Singapore, quite apart from basic things like connectivity, office space, and so on, I think the softer attributes of livability going forward are also going to be more important. What's going to be arts and cultural um, scene in Singapore? What's your food scene? What's going to be, is it is Singapore, does Singapore continue to be safe for families? Going forward, will we have a good, high quality, affordable healthcare system that takes uh, good care of our people? And I think these intangible, softer attributes are going to become more important. I think certainly for us, it's something that we are, we are paying much more attention to. And and over time, hopefully, we'll continue to keep this place a place where, you know, wherever you are, you say, hey, I want to, I want to start some, I want to do a startup. I want to uh, base my regional business out of Singapore. I want to post my expatriates to Singapore. Then Singapore becomes a place that comes top of mind. We offer a great a home, a great city, a great country for uh, those who wish to work and live here. 
And I hope that we can continue to do that for many more years to come. Thank you. Yeah. No, and, and look, I, I very much uh, echo those uh, comments as I think I said in my remarks. I think the uh, increased uh, flexibility of location plays in Singapore's uh, favor, given the quality of life proposition uh, and other elements of the Singapore proposition. I think Singapore becomes on net uh, more attractive. It doesn't make it inevitable, uh, but I think there are, there's a, if, if you like, um, there's in fact is working in Singapore's uh, favor. I think also in response to the question, it's important to, uh, Singapore needs to have a view on where it wants to compete. It's not going to compete with the lower skill, uh, lower wage uh, jobs. Now, I don't mean to sound callous uh, in saying that, but Singapore is a high cost, high wage economy on balance. And if you're trying to hold on to jobs where lower schools are required, you will find yourself being outcompeted by other jurisdictions. So I think this notion of you know figuring out where you are going to compete uh, and making sure you have the skills and other capabilities to uh, ensure you're successful in that space. And I think the other point that I, I would note is that actually many of the jobs that are being kind of offshore, relocated, uh, be it uh, uh, call centers um, uh, and sort of other kind of um, sort of uh, basic accounting services and the like, are increasingly getting automated. Uh, AI um, uh, and the like. So in a sense, there's always a race against uh, both other competition, but also against uh, technologies. And so I think for Singapore, given what Singapore is, you know, the need to continue to invest in skills and capabilities uh, in other intangibles to make sure that Singapore can retain the jobs that it wants uh, and can provide the jobs to people in Singapore. Uh, and so, you know, the, this notion of Singapore, jobs being uh, exited from Singapore is not a pandemic phenomenon, it's not a new phenomenon. And the way that Singapore's always dealt with that is by investing in skills. And I think that becomes uh, increasingly important going forward. Thank you. Uh, we, we now have a question that has received 13 votes. Uh, it is the highest voted question at this point. So the question from Jonathan Tan is, can the current economic model of uh, endless growth be compatible with sustainability? Basically, it's, I think what Jonathan is asking is, can we balance growth with sustainability? And how do we do that? Would either of you like to take a stab at this? Uh, I'll, I can, uh, sure. I'll, I'll take a, a quick step. I mean, it is um, a very complicated uh, sort of question to answer well. I mean, one encouraging aspect across many advanced economies is the extent of decoupling of uh, growth in GDP against emissions. So in, in most advanced economies, certainly within Europe, emissions are now tracking downwards. There are kind of ambitions for net zero by 2050 or earlier and expectation that GDP is going to continue to grow over that period. So that will certainly require transformational changes in industrial systems, in transportation systems, in food systems. It will require quite wrenching changes across many aspects of our commercial uh, and social lives. You know, different countries are differently placed in terms of their appetite for that and how well placed they are for that. Uh, but I think that there is a, you know, rightly a measure of confidence in our ability to, if you like, square the circle. Now, you know, there will be higher costs. Uh, it might be that there are trade-offs uh, between delivering against reducing emissions uh, and uh, optimizing on, on economic growth. I think that's almost nearly the case. It might be that we're in for sort of uh, higher inflation and a slightly lower GDP growth trajectory than would otherwise be the case. Uh, but I don't think that's the case that you have to, if you like, create a GDP in order to deliver against uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions targets. Uh, and I'm uh, encouraged, without wanting to be utopian about this, I'm encouraged by the extent of progress over the last uh, decade uh, in terms of renewable energy um, pricing, in terms of new technologies like hydrogen uh, and others. Uh, I mentioned, I think, during my remarks, the speed of shift in consumer and investor preferences around everything from uh, diet, you know, moving from red meat to plant-based substitutes, uh, attitudes to long-haul travel. You know, I think we're on the cusp of quite a significant transformation that will open up new opportunities in parts of the economy uh, while imposing a cost on other parts of the economy. So I think there's going to be a significant reallocation, if you like, of where economic activity happens. Uh, there'll be a significant shift in business models as a consequence of that. I think governments need to be quite active in terms of putting a price on emissions, in terms of encouraging renewable energy that will require significant capital investment. Governments, I think, need to create markets uh, in many cases. Uh, but you know, much as the vaccine saved us uh, during COVID, you know, I remain somewhat hopeful that technology in the context of renewables and other business models will be sufficient to allow us to continue to, if you like, run our economies in a recognisable way, while at the same time being able to drive emissions down to where they need to get to so we don't exceed, you know, one and a half degrees. So that's my 
somewhat optimistic uh, take on things. And I think Singapore is moving on many of those dimensions in, in the right direction. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, David. Um, I generally agree with you. I, I think sometimes the sort of dichotomy between growth and sustainability arise because a large part of how we see growth and the economy today is still very much carbon heavy and carbon dominant. So, but there is a transition underway. We are, as I mentioned in my in my remarks as well, we things it will not be smooth sailing. Things may get tougher, and I think will likely get tougher because before it gets better, um, in a sense that the transition to a sort of a low carbon environment is going to be one of the most fundamental and difficult transitions for all of humankind, to be honest with you, because so, so much of our daily lives, daily economic activity at, at this current moment is tied to carbon. But at the same time though, I mean, the attitudinal shifts, the investor shifts, the flows of capital, the bets on technology, they are accelerating. The pace at which, the pace at which these have developed over the last two years has been multiple times of the preceding five and multiple times of the preceding 20. So I think that uh, we are optimistic. As far as Singapore is concerned, I think uh, our commitment uh, to being uh, a sustainable economy will mean that naturally our economic structure will have to change. And in so doing, I think we will have to make sure that the change is well managed, is not too disruptive. But at the same time, we should we should not get too down about it. I mean, we have had situations before where we've looked at an adverse situation, a very challenging situation. I actually turned it around and said it become an advantage. I mentioned water in my remarks. You know, now with new water, for example, we've been able to be a lot more um, self-reliant, self-sufficient. And I think that with carbon, I'm sorry, excuse me, with sustainability, the development of new solutions, whether it's carbon capture and storage, for example, whether it's carbon trading, as I mentioned before, whether or not it's just green financing and what that means for, uh, companies' business models. I mean, these are some areas where it's not just about honouring our, our commitment to um, sustainable economy, but also more important, creating solutions that can be exported the world over and therefore creating a new economic engine that is certainly compatible with sustainability. So I'm quietly optimistic. I mean, we will have to work hard. We will have to be prepared for a couple of uh, bumpy years. I think it's in terms of the transition, it will not be smooth. But again, I'm quietly optimistic that we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel and David. I should mention that some of these issues will pop up again in the later panel session, uh, City as a Green Space. So certainly there's a, been a lot of uh, interest in sustainability. And we have about four minutes left, so I'm just going to bring the conversation back to geoeconomics, to the city, to trade. And one question from Dr. Jillian Cole from IPS is, moving out of the pandemic, which are the cities that we will be competing against? And which should we be compete, cooperating more closely with? And if I may add on, uh, in the earlier session with Mr. George Yeo, Mr. Yeo talked about Singapore possibly becoming a capital city for Southeast Asia. Is that something that you see happening? What would that look like for Singapore, given our, already our economic trajectory today? So broad, broadly, two questions, global cities, competition and cooperation, and the possibility of Singapore playing a bigger role in ASEAN. Do you, uh, David, do you mind if I maybe... No, take, you, yeah. you so um, let, let's just put it this way. I mean, in terms of which cities will we partner with, I would say um, uh, all of them. I mean, it's a bit like Hard Rock Cafe's motto, love all, serve all, <laughs> and we want to be friends with all. I mean, that is that is part of our karma as a small city, small city state, um, you know, and we want to be friends with everybody. But in terms of competition, I would say certainly that uh, we should not be too complacent too. I mean, I mentioned the global cities, your Londons, your New Yorks, your... Um, Tokyo's and so on and so forth. I think there's a certain heft and ballast about them that comes with history and size and just their, their place in this world that I think will mean that they will continue to be uh, cities that we will look up to. And notwithstanding what David mentioned about that there are idiosyncrasies that sort of constrain the accuracy of the comparisons with them. Nevertheless, I mean, really, when you look at the global cities, I think these were the cities which set the standard and we should, we should we always have to sort of keep an eye on. But there will be new ones as well coming up. I mean, I think uh, what's going on in the Middle East, especially the UAE and Dubai, is something that we are watching uh, very, very carefully. Obviously, Southeast Asia, to the extent it is a huge huge growth sector, Jakarta, or in future Kalimantan may well be uh, one of those areas which are very, very, very exciting things going on in there. And I think it's important that we continue to uh, work very closely with them and partner them as part of our longer term uh, future. Uh, will Singapore be a capital city for Southeast Asia? I would just say that uh, we certainly don't want to claim to be the capital city for Southeast Asia. After all, there are 10, at least certainly within ASEAN itself. But I think that if we are able, to, I would say that if we are able to continue to invest in the foundations that have got us so far, continue to upskill, continue to make those wise policy choices, as David said, I think there's no reason why we cannot continue to be 
a hub in Southeast Asia, uh, which is both a, I actually quite like David's formulation, not just a hub, but also a platform uh, through which um, our neighbors can work through us for the rest of the world and vice versa for the world to work through us to engage Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, I mean, that's something that we aim to do, not because we have any grand ambitions to be the Southeast Asian hub city, but rather because we believe very fundamentally in creating better lives for our people. And that I think uh, if we are able to succeed in that, if we're able to harness the opportunities in Southeast Asia, I think that would naturally put us in a good position. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. David. Uh, just um, very quickly, and I think a couple of uh, observations. One, I think the intensity of global competition is going to continue to uh, increase. It's uh, been a kind of a, a one-way bet over the last few decades, and I think that will uh, continue. But I would also say at the same time, the global economy is becoming more regional and local uh, in nature. Supply chains are being a bit more uh, constrained. The average distance of trade is beginning to uh, reduce. Uh, you know, partly that's economic, partly that's a bit political. So I think in terms of you know, global benchmarking, absolutely. You should be looking to the Londons and the New Yorks and the Parises for insight and for benchmarking, if you like. But in terms of the economic space in which Singapore wants to develop a presence and wants to lead, I think increasingly that's going to be Asian defined. We can define Asia, obviously, reasonably broadly. Uh, and so trying to figure out what that means, you know, as the global economy is reconstituted, it kind of fragments uh, in, a, in a way. What does that mean for, for global and for regional flows? And how does Singapore uh, adapt its model to play a leading role in being a hub and a platform uh, for those flows. It's not going to be a million miles away from what Singapore is doing at the moment, but it is going to be somewhat different. The MNC behaviour is going to be different. The behaviour of Singapore firms is going to be different. Uh, and so I think you know, Singapore, I don't know if, if capital city is quite the right word, but Singapore is a leading uh, economic, financial and other uh, node uh, in ASEAN and in Asia more broadly. I think that's exactly the right aspiration to be having. And I think, as Singapore always has, adapting itself to a new global economic operating model is going to be one of the defining challenges, I think, over the next uh, decade uh, and, and beyond. Uh, but Singapore, I think, has a great base uh, to build on. It's just a matter of, of pursuing it with, with coherence uh, and seriousness of purpose, uh, two things that Singapore is, uh, is well known for. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Gabriel. I think this is a wonderful note to end this session on. And you have given us so much food for thought especially for our next session, City as Connected Space, which will begin at 11 a.m. sharp. So many of the things we're talking about today, we have talked about this morning, will likely flow into that session as well. So from wherever you are, I'd like to everyone to join me in thanking David and Gabriel for a wonderful session that we've had this morning. The video of today's session will be available on the online platform for two weeks. So we wish everyone a good break and see everyone back at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, Jintian. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.